Chapter 2.5, Part 3, Video Part 3, Architecture. So I'm going to back up and look at the um, arch again. Remember the Romans invent the arch, the true arch. We have these examples all over Europe where Rome's, the Romans had conquered. Roman Empire is now down to a low roar in the Middle Ages. Uh, it's, it's far smaller. It no longer exists in France. But we do see these arches are still here. So our churches that start to get built in the Middle Ages begin to use arches and the barrel vault. So we saw this. This is Romanesque. Remember that. That's the first style of the Middle Ages. There are two. So the beginning of the Middle Ages is the Romanesque with the true arch and some very tall ceilings. But we go even further when we get into the Gothic. Now, Gothic architecture has several different changes uh, within the features, one of which is this cross design. That's the floor plan. So you can see how it imitates a cross. The doorway, the entrance, is always oriented toward the west and the east, and that's also what we call the orientation. That is oriented toward the east. The east is the orient. The west is the occident. So that is how the church would normally be laid out. Then we have our radiating chapels here, and we have some little alcoves and niches around here, um, also sometimes down the aisles, where there would be relics or reliquaries um, from different saints, their bones or bone fragments or um, clothing items, and they would be put into a special sort of a worship area so that the pilgrims could come around this aisle and into the ambulatory area, you could call this an ambulatory as well, uh, and visit these different relics and then sort of go on their pilgrimage and they would they would um, gain virtue by seeing all these different reliquaries, okay? The main part of the church where the priest and other um, ceremonial objects and, and uh, the area where the activity for the main parishioners would be here and the parishioners would be sitting here with their pews. So we're going to look at a, cr a cutaway. We can now see this pointed arch. We're going to look at some other images too. But the pointed arch here, that's the difference. That's the big change with Gothic architecture. The other change is the flying buttress, the open, there's all this negative space here to allow light in. A solid buttress looks like this and we're going to look at examples of both. But we have more height, like the Romanesque was probably down here somewhere, and now with the Gothic, we're just all that much higher. This is the Abbey Church of Saint-Denis in France. So we see the elongated stained glass windows. Exterior, which we can't see at the moment, but the flying buttresses might be coming off right here. Um, there's no flying buttresses on the interior. I see students make that mistake, please know that the flying buttresses are an exterior architectural element. We have a groin vault here. This is pointed. It's just subtle, and this, I, this viewpoint is a little hard to see. This is a pointed arch, and this is a um, groin vault, and this is a ribbed arch here. We see this sort of uh, ribbing right here with this um, minimization of stone, but it still has a concentration right here to hold it up. Pointed windows and then stained glass. Stained glass is another element of the Gothic. Abbot Suger, <clears throat> excuse me, he wanted worshipers. He was an architect and he went to see the Hagia Sophia, which we're going to look at in a moment, about uh, domes, and he wanted to extend the height of the ceiling and also allow light in to uh, let worshipers be bathed in divine light. That's really important with Gothic architecture, really trying to emulate a sense of divine light. And those are biblical stories in the stained glass, but um, a little bit hard for, for parishioners to see that. Mostly it's about the light. Exterior of Chartres Cathedral. Here we can see a solid buttress here. Just kind of a massive, um, big sort of column. This is a bit square shaped, but um, exterior features holding up. And then we have a flying buttress here, but you can see it better over here. You can see how the weight is being transferred down to this load and going down. 
You can see the cross design here. So this is coming out and there's another roof line going over here. You can't see it. And this has a rose window here. A rose window has biblical stories in the stained glass. That's a common Gothic feature and also uh, contemporary art. Uh, sorry, a contemporary architectural feature for churches. The windows, it's a little bit hard to see, are here where the flying buttresses allow for some openings. Now we're going to move on to domes and we're going to start with the Hagia Sophia, or we're going to start with the Pantheon, sorry. So a dome is like an arch. So, <clears throat> excuse me, and you kind of know what a dome is, but it's a strong structure. It's displacing all that weight uh, with that circle. Remember I made that net egg analogy, the weight is, is being transferred, the load is, is evenly spaced, so there's not like one area holding it up, the, the intense weight is being displaced. This is the Pantheon in Rome, same time frame as our Pont du Gard um, aqueduct, our archway, roadway and aqueduct. <clears throat> the oculus here, this is an opening. That is just wide open, there's no glass there, rain comes through, and the floor has to be mopped, but not, you know, too frequently. This is a, a really beautifully um, curved structure. This this is a fish-eyed photograph, we're getting a little distortion, but this is a perfectly formed uh, half circle, or half sphere. Here, these are called coffers, and it's a coffered uh, ceiling. To remove some of the mass, this works kind of like the flying buttresses where you don't need all of that massiveness to hold up the weight, but you do need, you know, a continued arch, and that happens, you know, in this grid form. So a bit of that weight in the concrete, and this is concrete by the way, uh, but a little bit of that weight is removed. So it comes down, and there's an exterior building which we don't have an image of in this PowerPoint. But it's quite beautiful with a Greek portico out to the front. So this is originally for um, many gods, pantheon for all of the gods. And um, you can see some of the statuary is still, still extant and the marble floors are um, extant as well. 500 years later, the Hagia Sophia in the Byzantine Empire is built. And for a thousand years until 1500, it is the largest interior um, church space, if you will. See how small the people are, it's pretty mind-boggling how huge this thing is. Huge dome, and it's sitting on top of another structure with some other sort of half domes and, and partial cur you know, arches and so on. And this is called a pendentive. It's a structure to support this um, massive dome. But we have some clerestory windows here. Uh, and that is where Suger gets the idea 700 years later to build Gothic architecture. So we're kind of going back and forth in time here. Try not to get too confused. Um, but it's an enormous roof and the pendentives, which we're going to look at in just a second. I'm going to skip ahead. You can see how the pendentives transfer the weight down from the dome. Okay. Now we'll look at the exterior briefly for the Hagia Sophia. And it's just this tremendously gorgeous building. Uh, Istanbul, uh, Constantinople, same city. Istanbul it has, um, it is a port city and where it, it, the, it's kind of where East and West, where Europe and Asia meet. It's the edge of that. So we have flying, we ha sorry, we have cr regular buttresses here, some solid mass and then some buildings as well to support the, the, this massive roof. These minarets were added later. It was originally a Christian uh, structure, then it became an Islamic structure, and now it is a museum. I do think it might have gone back and forth a number of times. 